New York, London, and PBS performances received not only acclaim from critics and audiences, but also from the Marx family. He's also appeared in off-Broadway in the Groucho role in the musical The Coconuts, written by the legendary George S. Kaufman, who he also portrayed in the one-man show By George. As a director, he helmed productions of Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boys, Brighton Beach Memoirs, and Laughter on the 23rd Floor, in which he also starred. He's performed as the comic host Caesar in Teatro Zinzani. I'm going to handle that one. Teatro Zinzani. So I think we've run out of time. (laughs) We're out of time. It's one of those, some guinea production. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Frank will explain later. (laughs) Teatro (laughs) Zanzani. Teatro. Teatro (laughs) Zanzani. In productions from Seattle to Amsterdam and has performed lead roles in prominent regional theaters, co-starring with Tony Award winners Faith Prince and Kristen Chenoweth. He's also received glowing reviews from artists such as Bill Irwin, Robin Williams, Carol Channing, and even Stephen Sondheim. And he's been illustrated by the likes of Al Hirschfeld and Drew Friedman. And the guy was even the answer to a Jeopardy question. A film version of the stage show retitled Frank Ferrante's Grout Show will premiere on public television stations around the country April 2022. We're excited to welcome to the show a fellow Marxist and a gifted performer whose work inspired Animal Crackers and a Night at the Opera co-writer Maury Riskin to say Frank is the only actor aside from Groucho himself who delivered my lines as they were intended. The one, the only, Frank Ferrante. Oh my, e- easy for you to say, Gilbert. I loved it. Thank you for the. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I can't wait to meet this Ferrante character. Yeah. He's here. <laughs> He's here. Gilbert, thank you. And Frank, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I love well, the show. Welcome, Cheech. Uh, was any of that true? Anything in the intro? Y- yeah, it was all true. And I was okay, thinking, good. <laughs> I, sh- I should have spent less time being so insecure after hearing that. I guess of I actually course. did a couple things. Thank of you. Of course. I'm now, glad, I wrote, glad I wrote that. Now, uh, no, no one has ever asked me to play the old Groucho in the movie. Uh, did they ever ask you? No, they did not ask me, though I did it in Groucho Life and Review for years. But you, hey, listen, I vote for you, Gilbert. I'm a fan. You, you are the old Groucho, if you, if you ask me. But no, I wasn't asked. But, you know, for years I was, I played in Arthur's show that I did in New York when I was 23. I was playing Groucho from age 15 to 85. Now this was initially the Gabe Kaplan show that was out there that you That's had right. the, you did yes. that you did an amazing interview with Gabe. Yeah, and he thanks. it was it was written as a vehicle for Gabe uh, by Arthur Marx and Robert Fisher and uh, never made it to New York or London and uh, it was a different show by the time we took it to New York. And in that we the the show was revamped, it was re, it was cut and they added this younger part. So I started I really spanned 70 years, but for a 23-year-old and 24-year-old to be playing Old Groucho, you know, you know, it's, yeah. it was. I think that's what turned on the critics and and audiences. And no one expected some twenty two year old gentile from Pasadena to kind of pull it <laughs> off, you know. So <laughs> that's what happened. But no, no one's to answer your question, Gilbert. No one's asked me, but you know, you've got my vote, man. Oh, I can. I, I that that's the best compliment. Seriously, I you have given me so much <laughs> laughter with that. With your old Groucho, it's the it's the stuff of you know genius. See, because I I remember it's like Groucho had disappeared for a while, mm-hmm. and then I became fascinated with him when he got back. Like he was this, you know, I was scared watching him. Oh, 
that that he wouldn't be able to complete the joke or that he die right there. Oh, I, I'm Gilbert. I'm with you. I I think it's because we all loved him so much. We're rooting for him, and you got to kid it because it was so painful. I, I mean, I saw him when I was a kid, and it was I we were on pins and needles, and he was much more ancient in person than he was on Dick Cavett or or any of the other programs he was doing at the time. But uh, what, still, what year was that, Frank? You, you was, said but he was 86, you say? He was 86. Just before his 86th birthday was 1976. I was 13 years old, and I was a fanatic from the time I was nine. I was, saw a day at the races, changed my life. I was taught by nuns, and then I saw a day at the races, and I figured <laughs> I want to treat the nuns the way Grouch was treating Margaret Dumont. I loved it. You know, he was, <laughs> he was just so, you know, what, what can you say, impudent and unfiltered. And, thought, mm-hmm. Damn. and I was a shy kid, like most kids mm-hmm. are. And so, and so uh, my dad knew I was obsessed. They indulged my obsession for not just the Marx Brothers, for all those old comedians that we all love. Uh-huh. You know, I, early on I was reading Steve Allen's The Funny Men, and this was like my Bible. And then Son of Groucho when I was 11, which was written by Arthur Marx. I did a book report on it. But anyway, it's 1976. My father takes the day off of work and to take me to see Groucho, who's going to promote a book, The Groucho File, 1976. Groucho's supposed to show up at noon. No Groucho. Finally shows up at 3 o'clock. This is the Ambassador Hotel in, on Wilshire. And we get there. There's a 1,000 people, mostly young people, college and younger, college age and younger. And uh, Groucho finally shows up, and in, 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 uh, Aaron is there, Aaron Fleming. Hector Arce, who wrote the, that great biography, Groucho. Well, I think it's the best of all the Groucho biographies, mm-hmm. in my opinion. I and, agree with uh, you. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's the first one that kind of takes Groucho on. Uh, his pers- you know, his per- you know, his person and his personality. But anyway, so Groucho finally shuffles in, and Aaron is waving everyone off. And get away from him! Get away! He's not a freak. Don't put him behind a table. And and I I stick to him, like I'm meant to be part of his entourage. There, <laughs> Groucho's walking to the podium. Gets to the podium. I'm standing right behind him. I've got one of his books. I want him to sign. He gets to the podium. He's at the podium, and he's mumbling. Can you hear me out there? Can you hear me out there? You know, just in, we are waiting, we're waiting for the joke. We're, we're all going, no, and we're, we want him to say, well, you're not missing anything. Well, he, he didn't do that. He just kept mumbling. And finally, someone asked Groucho the question, Groucho, are you making any new Marx Brothers movies? He looked up slowly and said, no, I'm answering stupid questions. And the audience went, crazy they went nuts <laughs> and a, a woman a woman asked groucho groucho uh, what do you dream about he looked at her and said not you <laughs> that's great so I so mean, at 86 even without the fastball he was still bringing it yeah so i guess my point is even though he was falling apart and he was gl- his eyes were glazed over he was still able to you can see the gears just kind of moving it was beautiful, and he, you know, someone, he, you know, he just went on and on, and he's, I, I asked the first question because in my teenage brain, I thought I'm going to rile him up. He looked so inert; he looked like a, a zombie. So I knew how he felt about Nixon. So 13 year old Frank goes, uh, "Groucho, what do you think about Nixon?" And he says, "I hate Nixon. Nixon ought to be in jail." And the audience, everyone loved it. So, and that was it. And wow. Um, He's and you still... followed him out to the parking lot and, and <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Tell, tell, tell Gilbert that, what, Aaron, Aaron came between you and your yes. hero? Yes, yes. So, so, like, <laughs> I'm Gra- sure you weren't the only one. <laughs> Groucho, Groucho kills it, and everyone's happy. It's a triumph. And then he, he, you know, he, then he deflates and shuffles off, and there was this stairwell. We were on the first floor, and he's starting to, the second floor, and he's starting to go down the f- stairwell, but painfully slow. And he gets to the bottom. I'm on the top of the stairwell, and I'm looking down at my hero. There's Groucho and Aaron and... RC and I scream at the top of my lungs, Groucho's great! And <laughs> Groucho just kind of looks up and waves, and Aaron shoots the steely, steely glare at me, like, you know, don't need this. And then I run down the stairs, and I'm right, I'm trying to get in between Aaron and Groucho, and she won't let me get in there. And I'm, I was, I wanted to meet him. This was to me, this is God, he's the funniest man in the world. This guy's changed my life. He, he's made, I, I'm braver because of him. And, um, I say to, I'm trying to ingratiate myself, Gilbert, and I say to uh, Aaron, I say, uh, Groucho sure is lucky to know you, and you're lucky to know Groucho. And she looks at me and says, no, Groucho's lucky to know me. Oh, <laughs> How about that, Gil? Oh, to, 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 to a 13-year-old and wow. a, f- a fan. Oh. And, uh, 
And, and therein lies the problem. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah. And one of the questions was, when, when that question was asked, and I was there right, I was two feet away from Groucho at this event, and sitting, be, sitting behind him was Aaron, and the question, what do you dream about, not you? She mouthed the word money. I swear to you, she went, money. Ooh. You can hear her. You know, and uh, so that kind of told me the story there, what was going on. And then Groucho goes into his, into his town car, into the sunset. I see him in silhouette. And my cousin, who was also a Groucho fan, 13 years old, said, for, uh, I said, Ralph, I said, take a photo of Groucho from behind. There's something, I don't know why, I had a cinematic. It was theatrical. I want to see in the beret, kind of stooped over, and that's the last I'll see my hero. Mm-hmm. And he took the photo. I have that photo. And in the end of, at the end of the show that I do is Groucho. Ten years to that week, I opened in New York, Gil, Gilbert. And um, the end of the show is me as old Groucho in the beret from behind in silhouette. I must be going. And the pin spot goes out. Boom. It was, it's, inc- it's a wild that's great. experience well, that I got I, to have. I just watched the PBS special that you were kind enough to send me that's, uh-huh. going, that's going to. We'll plug it now. We plugged it in the, uh, in uh-huh. the opening. April 1st. Right, Thank you. All, all over the country. Yes, and that's yeah. that's that's the show that I, I that I did in, at USC as a college project, and uh, I invited Arthur Marks to see me in that show. This is back in '85. I invited Miriam Marks Allen to see me. I invited everyone that knew Groucho, uh, Maury Riskind. I mean, I had a lot of guts. I just wanted to. Do You're this. a 22 year old kid with chutzpah, right? I, had, <laughs> I did, but you know, I was just I just was into him. He gave me such. I don't know. I just loved him. He was like for so many of us. He was an alter ego. He was he was armor. He was a grandfather figure, and uh, I needed him. And he, he gave me, like I said, he bolstered me, emboldened me. And so I invited uh, Robert Whitey, who had done the first sure. documentary on the Marx Brothers, the, the Marx Brothers in a nutshell. He, I, I contacted him, and he gave me all of these names. I invited literally hundred people. I invited Jack Lemmon, Lucy Ball. None of them showed up, but the key players did. Arthur. Miriam and Maury, the last of the great Marx Brothers writers. And Maury Riskin at the time was 89. So here I am now on campus at USC, going to put on this one-man show. Now, I got the script from Elaine Stritch, of all things, who I barely knew who she was at the time. Because <laughs> I'm a That's a great kid. story. <laughs> you know, and I'm, ri- I'm writing Elaine Stritch. Hey, it's to uh, the ladies. Have lunch. You know, I didn't realize that she was this Broadway legend, but I'm writing. And she was married to John Bay. And I, dear Mrs. Bay, I didn't re- even call her Mrs. Stritch or Miss Stritch. And they're all handwritten letters. I'm, but the reason I'm writing here is because her late husband, John Bay, had done a show about Groucho called it An Elephant in My Pajamas. And that was the genesis of the show that I continue to do, in, uh, An Evening with Groucho, which is the one that's going to be on, on PBS, PBS soon. So anyway, I, I'm digressing, but I finally wore down Elaine Stritch, and she told me, Frank, I'm going to be at Johnny Carson's Tonight Show as a guest. Uh, why don't you meet me there? So afterward... I sent back, back a note, and afterwards she comes out and she says, Frank, you can use my late husband's script. And so I do that show at USC. Wow. And, and, what, a, uh, what a nice thing for her to do to oh, you, for, she, for, for a kid. Amazing. I mean, how many people do that? And particularly someone like her, you know, kind yeah. of like a renowned crankster, but she was very generous with me. But I'm, 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 at, I'm doing the show. I'm nauseous I'm, uh, the, before I go on. Because Arthur's there, Miriam's there, and, and Maury Riskin was the one that scared me. And I mean, come on, I'm going to be doing one morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. I'm going to do all those jokes from Animal Crackers and Coconuts. They're all in there, and he wrote them which, mm-hmm. with George Hoffman. It's like, <laughs> what, what? and I did it, and the show went well. And uh, there was a little reception afterward. And Maury Riskin was about I don't know three feet tall at this point, and a little, you know, just wizened guy. And, but uh, he comes up to me after the reception and says, "So oh, Frank." Uh, I hear you're all of 22. Isn't it time you retired? It, it, it was great. It was very, very one-liner, you know, approach to it all. But he was fantastic. So Arthur said to me that night, Frank, if I ever do a show about my father again, I'd like to use you. And I graduated and uh, went to uh, Kansas City Dinner Theater. They're paying me to play Groucho, my hero, in a show directed and written by Arthur Marks. And then within a year, we were in New York. It, insane. So that's... That was it, and I became really close to Arthur and Miriam, uh, like we were family. But that's how that's how it, that's how it started. Now here's a question I think you already Incredible. answered, mm-hmm. but I still want to hear what was your opinions on Aaron Fleming? Well, I, I as a kid, I despised her because I just read about the abuse. I was opening up the L.A. Times and the Herald Examiner, and the headlines were you know 
Groucho abused. And then I read stories, and then I heard from family members and friends what, what was going on. And I know, it's a, I know it's a controversial issue, but the idea that there's one story that just I can't, I wish I'd never heard it, and that's the story where he's had strokes and he's at the, at the dining table and he can't feed himself, and uh, she's feeding him. And she's going, come on, baby, eat your food, baby. And she's laughing. And he goes, what's so funny? She goes, you are. You're the funniest man in the world. And he says to her, not anymore, I'm not. It's just, that's, wow. it's, it's hard for me to root for her in any way. Uh, you know, she was, uh, she was someone who saw an opportunity. Uh, did she get him out there? Yes. Did we get to see him more because of it? Yes. Did I get, and maybe I know him because in part she was, she was involved. But you know what? I fell in love with Groucho without Aaron Fleming. I saw Day at the Races, and I never laughed so hard. Sure. When I was well, you know, old. there's two there's two sides to that coin. I mean, and uh -huh. we've talked to a lot of people about it, and, and some mm -hmm. people say, yes, but she was the one that kept him going. She was the one that got him out of bed. She was the one that, that organized the parties where Hamlish mm -hmm. would come over and play, and Groucho would get up and sing. And, and, right. and, and so, you know, uh, it, it's... And the truth of the matter is Groucho was difficult. Groucho was caustic. I mean, I've got to, you know, I got to dig in. I have an unusual perspective on it because I was really close to, to Arthur and Miriam up to their passing. Miriam lived to be 90. Mm -hmm. Arthur lived to be 89. I knew them for 25, 30 years. Uh, and in a way, and it sounds odd, in a way I feel they were working through their relationship. With, and I don't want this to sound narcissistic but, or self-indulgent, but I think they were working through stuff with me because I was a mensch. They saw how much it affected me and how it affect, how Groucho affected people like you, Gilbert, and Frank, and mm -hmm. thousands of us. Uh, it it he changed our point of view. The li life is crazy, and how do you deal with chaos? How do you create chaos? Um, how well, do you, you know, we, we we know he had a, a strained relationship or a difficult relationship, a problematic relationship uh -huh. with with Miriam and mm -hmm. and with Arthur. But they came they came to see you as a as a, a bit of a kindred spirit or almost a sibling. In, um, in, they came to me as a... They came to see you, I said, uh, uh, they, uh, they as, came... as, 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 a, as, as someone who understood. And, well, and as I said, almost a sibling. Right. Well, I don't know. You know it's, I don't know how I got them there, but they came. You know, Arthur, I didn't know Arthur. I didn't know Miriam, but they said yes to sh showing up at this performance. And um, it's so strange with them. Uh, Miriam invited me over shortly the after, thereafter, and I drive to her house. And, I, you know, I'm just a... Like I said, I'm a kid, and I get out of the car, and I get in there. And later she told me, Frank, I felt like my father was back. And and uh, it was moving to me. So I think, you know, eventually I just, you know, I, I'm a, I, eventually our friendship was not about Groucho, certainly. We're, I'm sitting in the backyard with Arthur Marks after 20 years. Groucho's not in the room. What's, who's, who's in the room is an old friend of mine who I worked with, who was a colleague, mm -hmm. a friend, and who I didn't want to die. We were 40 years apart, and we'd be in his backyard. I'd, I'd smoke a cigar or have a, you know, a whiskey or whatever, and we were two friends. And, you know, I, they went through a lot of pain. Their mother's an alcoholic. Ruth is an alcoholic. The father is larger than life and caustic. He, they loved him, though. I have to say, people mm. ask me all the time, what is it about Groucho? What, what did you learn about Groucho? Groucho gave a damn about his kids. He loved those kids. Was he the perfect father? Not even close. Am I? No. But we try, and he tried, and it's evident in his letters. It's, uh, it came through in the stories that Arthur and Miriam tell me about him. It, I find him very moving, and he's very human. Uh, you, you can you never said, really tell, tell someone's story in a book or in a movie. We're all complex, not. you know. Of course not. Well, you said to me on the phone something interesting mm -hmm. last night, that, that he, you know, he didn't really get an, anything resembling a normal childhood himself. Oh. So he, oh. you know, I, I, you know, Sam, his father was a character and Minnie, Minnie was domineering, with, which we all which we all know. And you, you were saying to me that you really believed and they believed Arthur and, and Miriam believed that he did the best he could. Absolutely. And another thing, Groucho was on the road. Imagine, Gilbert, you've got teenagers his, and I've got teenagers. He's. Grouch is on the road when he's 14 alone. Think of the terror of that, the horror of that, running out of money, food. He was abandoned on the road when he was 14 years old, left by the company, and just had to get, him, had, had to get himself back to, to Manhattan. So he went through a lot, and stuff we can't even relate to. I mean, I have a net. Most of us work with a net. We've got credit cards. We've got support. They, they were poor. They had nothing. That's what makes him so remarkable to me, and that family is so remarkable. And then just to have this talent. 
And another thing I learned about Groucho was, and we, we all, the fans know this, just his, just his interest in educating himself. He had a, he kept a, you know, he was an exquisite writer, a prolific letter writer, kept a dictionary in his glove compartment, Arthur told me. He was always, you know, working on his, on his language. And it's, it's, you, you know, that's why he's so fluid in his speech and his mind is yeah. so fluid. He's, he's physically fluid. You know, he's, and he's contemporary. I think that's why when we're all gone, we're going to be looking at Groucho 100, 200 years forever. It's, it's nice that even though he was insecure about the lack of a formal education, he, he was respected and admired by the writers that he respected. Absolutely. That, that he, he so wanted to be a part of that circle. He did. And, but, he, but he had their admiration. Oh, completely, completely. Uh, and uh, I just interviewed uh, this past year, and I just talked to her. Miriam's best friend is still alive, 95 years old. No one else knows this, I'm telling you. But uh, she was Miriam's best friend. Her name was uh, Adele Nadell, Beverly Hills. And she would go to the Marks household after school with Miriam, 1940, 41, 42. And I asked her, what was it like? Was it peaceful? Was it chaotic? She goes, it was the best. I learned about reading and music from Groucho, uh, topical events, current events from Groucho. Uh, she, and she's still alive. I still talk to her. And I talked to her because I miss Miriam. Miriam passed away five years ago. And yeah. We know we are the two that know. I, her nickname is Sunny, and I'm the only one who calls her Sunny. Miriam would call her Sunny, and uh, she, she had nothing but beautiful things to say about Groucho and the way he was with young people. He treated them as adults. He didn't uh, didn't you know treat them, look down on them, or treat them like children or babies. And that that's I don't know if he could. I don't think he knew how to parent that way, as you said. When you're on the, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you know, when you're getting syphilis at 14 from a from a from a hooker in Montreal, you know, that's not the way I was raised. You know, <laughs> well, I was, I, I you read the, you you read the books, the <laughs> Stephen Camper book, which is which is great. I mean, what he what he endured at, at 14, yeah. and, and and not to mention and, the anti-Semitism. Oh yeah, that the, the brothers endured. So, and so, yeah, absolutely, and we can't even imagine what that must have been like. It, it, you know, it's still that it's interesting. I uh, I tour my show, and Gilbert, you'd appreciate. It's it's part stand up. It's not I'm not it's not a tribute show. I'm not really an impersonator. I have such great respect for impersonators like Gorshin and Biner and Marilyn Michaels. That's that's an art form. Um, basically, an actor slash director and um, it, a crowd worker and inter, an interactive comedian and other things I do. But the Groucho role has been a through line in my life, which I'm so happy because I started at 20. I've been doing it for oh, this is my 38th year, Amazing. and so I get to introduce people to this character. But the show keeps evolving it's very a third of its improv uh that's my own stuff but you have to be careful i play i play two tours of australia with the character not everyone knows who he is the show has to work whether they know who groucho Marx. i was going to ask you that in, you know? in places all over the world uh, uh first of all and then i want to ask you what it was like playing him in at the age of 24 in london uh, yeah but uh, and and again, there you are on your own. In, in, yeah. in, in ten year, ten years older than Groucho, but in some ways walking in those, uh, in those, in those, in similar shoes. W- what is the reaction to 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 the show in places like Australia? They love him. They know him. They love him. They get the humor. They do. I, I did it in London when I was in my early twenties in the West End, and it was a big deal. And the, they, they, you can hear a pin drop. They listen to every word. They lo- it's like certain towns are great theater towns. London certainly is one. And there'd be, you know, lines outside the stage show. They want to meet the actors. What, I mean, it was so fun. Albert Finney would be there. Oh, Frank, that was sheer joy. And then he made a beeline for my girlfriend. And, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. And I love, you know, and I, I get to meet all these great people that I loved. I loved the dresser. I loved Albert Finney and the dresser. I got to meet all these legends. But... Um, they, it's strange. It, the show has to work. So do I change a little? You know, I do acknowledge his Judaism in the show at the end, but I used to do it earlier on. And I'd play these little towns in the Bible Belt, and you can, I'd say, uh, I'd make a reference to his Judaism, and you can feel the audience recede. And I thought, hmm, okay. I'm going to cut, I'm gonna cut, the, cut that line. Interesting. And I'm going to save it for the very end so they realize they've been, they've been loving a Jewish comedian for 90 minutes because they're standing by the end of that show every night. Very smart. We will return to Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast after this. Hey, guys, we want to talk about a sponsor we've discussed before on the podcast because we believe in their service and we're happy to sing their praises. Now, when it comes to e-commerce sales, why would you use anything but our friends at ShipStation? 
With ShipStation, you automate just about any shipping task and import orders from any sales channel. You save time by funneling all your orders into one simple interface, no matter what you're selling or where you're selling. Manage every order, Amazon, eBay, Etsy, from your own website, from anywhere, even your phone. Forget about the headaches from dealing with returns and return tracking. ShipStation wants to make your life easier, not harder, and they also want to save you money. When you compare carrier options and choose the best shipping solution every time. Now remember, ShipStation works with every carrier, so you can always find the best fit for you. Your small business can access the very same discounted rates usually reserved for Fortune 500 companies without the contracts or the commitments. So why not save your sanity knowing your orders are handled and you're getting the best rates. Make shipping the easy part of having an online store because you have bigger things to think about. No wonder 98% of companies that use ShipStation for a year keep using it for as long as they're in business. It's that good. So ship more in less time with ShipStation. Use our offer code GILBERT, you know that one, to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Who doesn't want that? Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in that promo code, which again is GILBERT, G-I-L-B-E-R-T, ShipStation, make ship happen. Do, do tell do tell that story, and we'll go back to the show because we jump around here like yeah. crazy. But since you mentioned your French, your long friendship with Arthur, mm -hmm. I thought the cigar story you told me was rather touching, and I think Gilbert would appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I when I first met Arthur, the, you know, he was he's a prickly figure. He was, you know, he's, he's and, and he, he he I believe Gilbert, <laughs> Gilbert, I believe <laughs> I, we talked about this. I believe Arthur is the one in his Bob Hope in his controversial Bob Hope book that first floated the idea. And oh correct, yes, that correct, was. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong here. When they were doing the tours of Vietnam, yeah, I, it's a, a famous story that you know he'd bring along all the hottest looking actresses, you know <laughs> Raquel Welch and Margaret, who, who, whoever was the big sex pot then, mm -hmm. and and he would say to them that if they didn't fuck him, he was leaving them in Vietnam. They'd all pack their stuff and get on the plane. And wave goodbye I'm, to I'm, her. I'm not sure it was to the major star so much as it was maybe to the yeah, to the yes, chorus yeah, girls. No. I'm not no, sure. No, you Ann wouldn't Margaret. do that. Raquel Welch <laughs> would do that to Raquel Welch. Uh, but, yeah, she would have had him shot. Cl Cliff <laughs> Nesterhoff will will correct me if it. this wasn't in uh, if this wasn't in 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 uh, Arthur's book, which is where I think it came from originally. Does any of this ring a bell, Frank? It does. That you know. Listen, I wasn't crazy about that book, as you know. I'm, yeah. I, I I appreciate hope, the young hope, and I yeah. thought Arthur, why would you do that? He's still. I said that to him. He's still alive, and his wife's alive, and uh, well, I called him out on it. And you but, did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so Ar Arthur wrote four Bob Hope movies. Exactly. So he knew his subject. Yes, he did. But I always thought, you know, hey Arthur, you know, your father was close to Bob Hope. They loved each other. They respected each other. Why would you write the book? But Arthur Arthur had a chip, you know, and, and it's something he worked through by the end of his life. And I saw him mellow with time, and I can tell you about that a little, a little bit. But, but yeah, that, that Bob Hope book is rough. <laughs> what know? is the cigar and, story, and though? This, <laughs> Go ahead, Gil. Uh, one, one thing I have to get, always get back to. Mm -hmm. Tell us some of the anti-Semitism they faced. Uh, well, there's the great, you know, the famous story that all that all Groucho fans know, of course. Uh, uh, Groucho uh, went to join the Sands Point Beach Club on Long Island, and he's at the height of his career. He's a Broadway star. Yeah, it's a great he's one. making movies by day, you know, by day and starring on Broadway by night. It doesn't get any bigger or better, and he's finally killing it, and he's feeling accepted to a certain extent. And he goes to apply to the for a membership at the Sands Point Beach Club, and the manager goes, uh, "Mr. Marx, we're delighted to have you here." He goes, "Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted that you're delighted. Everyone was delighted." Then he found out I was Jewish. He said, "Mr. Marx, I'm terribly sorry that we do not allow Jews to swim on our pool." And Groucho says, "Well, my daughter's only half Jewish. Can she go into the water up to her waist?" <laughs> <laughs> What's a better way to deal with it? You know, what do That's you do? That's great. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the fact that he was still dealing with that at that stage. I mean, oh. when you when you read the biographies, you know what they went through mm -hmm. on the on the vaudeville circuit, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, not, not at all. But uh, but but even but then he was a star. A star, yes. You know, it's hard to it's hard to. But I, before we lose it, I did want you to tell the cigar story. You and uh, you and Arthur in the backyard. Yeah, uh, I mean, because I would... Gilbert Gilbert will find that uh, he'll well, appreciate it. I would, you know, I spent a lot of time with Arthur, probably more time than just about anyone in my life for a 20-year period in there. 
And I'd go over there, and we'd we'd have we'd eat lunch or dinner and have a cocktail, and and I'd sit in his backyard, and we'd just talk about life. I, I really wanted to know about him because everyone's always asking about Groucho. What's it like to be Groucho? So I really made a point early on in our friendship to focus on who he was and what he was dealing with, and I like to know why people are why they are, why people are the way they are. And I wanted to learn about him, what his experience was really as the son of this man. So I'm in the backyard and we're chatting, we're having, you know, having a drink and, and I'm smoking the cigar and I, I, he says, Hey Frank, let's go in. I said, okay, let's go in. So we go in and I left my cigar in an ashtray outside and we're inside. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I didn't want to bring the cigar in to smoke. He goes, no, 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 Frank, bring it in. It reminds me of my father. Oh. That's kind of sweet, isn't it, Gil? Oh. Wow. And, and that was toward the end, and I thought, oh, okay. But he had a conflicted relationship with his dad. Of course. And he saw, you know, how, you know, and it drove him crazy because he knew, he told me, he did things, he told me stories that were, that I can't share. But, you know, one story was, you know, it, at the height of Groucho's popularity, post Marx Brothers, 1954, let's say, top rated show on television, he is on fire. Uh, he's he's won the Peabody Award. He's won an Emmy Award. He's on the cover of Time and Newsweek. He's he's you know he's there's the secret word. There's the everyone knows who he is. He's part of the national landscape. And uh, but at that same time, his beautiful daughter, Miriam, who I loved, uh, is an al- a raging alcoholic. I mean, and she has to go off to rehab basically in mm-hmm. Menninger's uh, clinic in Topeka. This is what's going on in the midst of his glory. He's coming off a marriage, going into another marriage. Arthur is going to write a book about him that he doesn't want to happen. He what doesn't want to have published, and he sues. He's, he he sues Arthur uh, because Groucho wants to be able to tell the story. Groucho doesn't want his privacy invaded. This is the fifties, and uh, Arthur said, "You know, I had to take my sister to Topeka. Why wasn't my father doing that?" And you know, and, and Arthur told me he was on the plane, and Miriam's got her coat on and a bottle of vodka on the way to the rehab falls out of her coat pocket and is rolling down the aisle and you know the clink, tink, 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 you know, <laughs> it's just horrible <laughs> and but he felt resentment about that and it's another story involving his mom that that it's not really appropriate to share but just you know he did he he saw kind of i think there was some cowardice that that was there he, that he, that that Arthur picked up on and felt that he bore the brunt which it which explains some of his bitterness um it's not you know who says it's easy to, to grow up? And but but yeah. Groucho, Groucho, it, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no. It it seems like that was always the problem with Arthur was that, I mean, he's the son of a legend. It's yes. like he's the son of a god. Absolutely. He's not, yeah. And so, what do you do with that? And he had talent, and somehow, even without his dad, he kept writing until the end. Wrote, he wrote like crazy. He wrote yeah, books. He, he wrote sitcoms. He wrote The Impossible Years, which was a, which w- ran for a long time on yeah, Broadway. Yeah, he, and, and he wrote this this my sh- the Groucho show that I did in New York. So he kept That's right. going, and uh, he wrote like forty two episodes. Minnie's Boys. Of Alice, Minnie's Boys. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the thing about I think about another thing about Groucho. I think about his influence. Both Arthur and Miriam were voracious readers. Uh, even when they were ill, deathly ill, they were still reading, and that's Groucho's influence. That was a gift that Groucho gave them, mm-hmm. and uh, I thought. That, and they both had computers, and you know, there's nothing more uh, entertaining than watching an octogenarian on a computer. But they figured it out, <laughs> and that was because they wanted to write and and stay in touch and stay connected to the world and to other people. And that's that's all Groucho's influence, and I got now, to we, see that. We had two guests mm-hmm. on this show. Both of whom we saw like tremendous Groucho Marx influence, even though they deny it. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, one of them, Alan Alda. Mm-hmm. I I mean, when you watch Mash, that's mm-hmm. like that's Groucho. Absolutely. And well, when, yeah, but I think it was I think it was Gelbart uh, who was who was who was making that happen. Who was who was pulling those strings? But yes, and well, and also yeah. uh, when I would watch the Adams Family. Uh, John Astin was doing a Groucho imitation with well, the again, cigar. Well, again, Nat Perrin right. <laughs> was running that show. <laughs> right. right. Uh, Nat Perrin. A Marx, a Marx Brothers writer. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting you're saying that. I, uh, Milton Berle recommended to Arthur that he cast Alan Alda for the role of Groucho in, initially for the stage show that I ended up doing. Never happened, of course. But, I, uh, of course, I loved Berle. Did you know Berle well, Gilbert? 
Uh, I met him like maybe two, three times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, met him. I, I met him he, twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he he always Frankie made me did. laugh. Yeah, oh, me too. Me too. Yeah. I, uh, I used to sit with him at the Friars Club, and you know, he's he's the one who said that the meeting age of the Friars Club is deceased. Um, <laughs> and uh, I I I, vis I I wanted to meet Uncle Milty. I'm like, you know, I love all these guys like you do. So it was the day after the North the Northridge air uh, earthquake. It was a deadly earthquake, and I figured, well, this will be a good time to meet. Uncle Milty at the Friars Club because no one's going to be there but Uncle Milty and I was right so I call over there and I talk to Alice it was the uh, out of right of out of central casting the receptionist there and she said sure come on by Milton Burl's here so I go there with a box of cigars expensive cigars get up the stairs and I walk in into the dining room at the Friars and I look to my right and it's Uncle Milty and Buddy Arnold, who wrote for for him, sure, the, and wrote Buddy the song. Buddy Arnold, wow, right? We're the men of Texaco. Da, 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 yeah. you know, that was him. And then, and then uh, the president of the Friars were there. So I kind of ingratiate myself. Said, "Mr. Burl, I'm a big fan of yours. Call me Milton." You know, and, <laughs> and and so I sat down with Milton, and we just kibitzed. And he said, "I'll tell you what, you go, you uh, do your show here, and uh, you can, we'll give you a membership. We'll do a trade off." And that's what happened. So he sponsored my membership to the Friars. Uh, in Beverly Hills, and uh, so I, but I, I would sit with them, and uh, I remember one time, and and if there were two people at the table with him, it's an audience. If it's one on one, you can get stories, and of course, again, I want to know about him. I want to know what motivates this guy. What's his What's his life like? What's it like now? And so uh, he says to me, Francis, Francis, he'd call me. Uh, he said, uh, I can't get it up anymore. He said, I can't get it up. I, I said, I said. Uh, I, says, I said, that's not working anymore. I, I don't know what to say. It's not, I, can't, I can't get it going. I said, I said, Milton, why are you telling me this? I said, I turn to you in every area for inspiration because now you can turn to me for constipation. <laughs> you know, <every> <laughs> I mean, well, in all in all fairness to him, that would that would that involves some serious lifting. Yeah, you need a crane, you know. So <laughs> some, yeah, hydraulics needed yeah, to be called. Yeah, we, we've in. we've had about ten guests on this show who have actually seen Milton oh. Berle stick or one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he, of course. It, it, anyway, I loved I loved Uncle well, Milty, I, and I loved hanging out with him. One time he was on stage, and the mic was too high. And he was like trying to push it to fix it to get it down to his mouth. And he goes, uh, he goes, oh, here's a switch. I can't get it down. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, I, I met I met him at the Friars yeah. in, in L.A. too. Yeah. And, he, and he just and I was sitting alone at the bar and he walked in. He took a seat, a couple of seats away from me. And he, he just started asking me if I use Viagra. <laughs> I, I mean, I was a little intimidated. It was right? Uncle Melty. But. He would have needed uh, a case just to get it a quivering. A case. I mean, I was in my thirties, so no. Yeah, yeah. not you, uh, but, him. But yeah, I know. But it was it was a strange uh, it was a strange thing to say to a stranger. Yes, uh, I remember but, when I did an episode of Cosby, when you could still proudly say that. <laughs> I did an episode, and and Milton Berle stopped by the set. Oh, what wow. did he what did he say to you, Gil? I uh, he uh, he. I, I remember they were, they were talking back and forth, and it was like they were talking about some bit that Jack mm -hmm. Benny did. And uh, I was just fascinated watching it because I was thinking, you know, Cosby is telling it his way, which is every little detail and pauses in between. And uh, Burl goes... Oh yeah, you mean one of these guys? And he does one of those goofy burl faces. <laughs> We're sticking his teeth out in right. the tongue. <laughs> Frank, weren't you one of the youngest friars? But the, by the way, the the late lamented uh, L.A. Friars Club, which yeah, is now yeah. which is now shuttered, which breaks my heart. But you you lunched there not only with Milty, but Sid Caesar and Maury Amsterdam and some I other did. wonderful characters. I, I did. I mean, I spent my favorite Father's Day with Uncle Milty, and he was giving me spit take training. We were doing double takes, triple takes. <laughs> I great. swear to God, Gilbert. And and Frank, he was dribbling all, all over this $5,000 suit. I mean, he, his spit takes were now dribble takes, but it was fascinating. It, you know, he'd be doing the whole head shake and, you know, eyes bulging, and it was great. But I would I would love it. And I loved Sid Caesar, who kind of, uh, in terms of uh, personality, where they were opposites, uh, Sid was become, like, was almost a... You know, like a Buddha at that point, he really he you know survived you know his alcoholism and sure. you know, it was in recovery. 
But um, he came by. I was sitting. This is not a funny story, but it's a story. I was sitting there with some colleagues of my, some friends of mine, actors, and we're sitting there. And, and Sid Caesar, old Sid Caesar, kind of comes by and just looks at me and goes, he doesn't know who I am. I didn't, hadn't met him before. He goes, don't punish yourself. Don't punish yourself. I spent my entire life punishing myself. Don't punish yourself. <laughs> and walked Ooh. away. Wow. That was wow. it. That was his life. Distilled to that, which is, you know, he, it, 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 remarkable. And there was another time he had to entertain some of the ladies of the Friars Club. Uh, and and um, Sid, see, they wanted Sid just to poke his head into the little room over there and, and wave. That's it. So I see Sid goes by our table and he looks at the, you know, it was the ladies who lunch and he sticks his head in there and waves and he starts coming back. I said, Sid, that was some of your best work. And, he, and I made Sid Caesar laugh and it was like, oh, great. I made Sid laugh. You know, you know how precious those moments are. But, but Sid, uh, you know, I got to play a Sid Caesar based character in that laughter on the 23rd floor. And to mm-hmm. me, Sid's one of the great punchers. I, I, I'm, I'm mad about him. I believe, I think that's, I think as a little kid, and I think we all might agree, I, you believe them. I believed everything Lucy did when I was two. I believed everything Eve Arden and Kay Ballard did when I was two. I believed everything. Yeah, they're everything. great salespeople. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you're, they're As completely performance. Yeah. yeah. But I remember being at the Friars in New York and Henny Youngman was there. Do you meet? Do you guys meet Henny? Oh, oh yeah. yes. Yeah, yes. Was, yeah. <laughs> it, it was so fun being with him. And he came to my show in New York. That was part of the fun of performing, of course, in a big city. You get these interesting heroes and uh, to show up and... I, you know, I had lunch with Henny, and at the end of the lunch, he turns to me, Frank, Frank, if you ever, if you ever need, if you ever need a friend, get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I for- remember I had lunch <laughs> with Henny Youngman, yeah. uh. and and while we were walking in, a pretty girl walks by, and Henny says. You look tired. Why don't you go up to my room and lay down? <laughs> <laughs> Frank, were you at that event at the L.A. Friars where it was like a party for Sid Caesar in the 90s? It was like Sid Caesar's 70th year in show business? No, but I, w- I went to a smoker once when, where he was there. And that was, that was, I love sitting there smoking cigars with Sid. It was heaven. Yeah. I and mean, what's I'm- better than that? This is like... This isn't happening. This yeah. is it was just the best. I'm sorry we didn't meet in those days because I used to go to the club with Al Goldstein, Gil. Oh, you're. <laughs> oh <laughs> the, my the, God! The yes. LA, yeah, the L.A. Friars. Yeah. Uh, did you bring Did you bring Robin Bird as your date? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I met I met Robin, but I, you know I met I got to meet you Hefner and Larry Flint and a lot of interesting people that were at the Friars once you were. Uh, once you were in Al's uh, and Milty, mm-hmm. what, tell us about this. Tell us about being a twenty. I can't wrap my mind around this. And you and I were talking about it on the phone last night. Yeah. Being a twenty-two-year-old kid, Arthur discovers you. Now you take the stage of the Lucille Lortel Theater. You're off Broadway mm-hmm. in New York, in the heart of it, and you're playing this icon. For God's sakes, you're twenty-three, and you said to me, "I didn't even know who I was. I didn't. Ha- I didn't even have a sense of self, but no. I had a sense of Groucho." Absolutely. It's true. And I knew I luck, how lucky I was. I realized that, that an actor twice my age would have been thrilled to have this role and opportunity. And I would, after the show sometimes, you know, I, I, was, you know, I was felt and I was, you know, sp- I couldn't sleep. I was just, you know, reverberating with energy. And uh, you know, I'm from a small town in California. Now I'm in the greatest city in the world and I'm in, on a Broadway stage and I'm meeting Garson Kanan and Shelley Winters and Kitty Carlisle Hart and you know, all Carol the new, Channing. Carol Channing. They're all showing yeah. up. Showing Frank, up. you were wonderful. Yeah. You, don't pu- <laughs> you don't push. When I was your age, I pushed. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, uh, I'm not sure what she was referring to, but, uh, <sighs> but, uh, but it was a, you know, but I would walk around at night till two, three in the morning just basking it, knowing it's going to end one day. I had the wherewithal to realize it's, it's not forever. Enjoy every second. And I did. I, I enjoyed every second. Even, at, that, even at that age, you had the presence of mind. Good for the you. Sh- and the show worked because you had three 20-somethings in that show sparking. The, 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 the show was solid. It was a good show. The performances, we were there to kill. We had nothing but energy and, and passion. And the, the, the performer that played the, all the women in Groucho's life, Dumont and Faye McKenzie and uh, the wives, that was Faith Prince who went on to win a Tony sure. Award for opposite Nathan Lane and Guys and Dolls five years later. And so, we'll name check. We'll name check the great, late great Rusty McGee, who was also oh, in that yes. show. Uh, oh, was a, fr- now, a friend now, of yours and mine. Yes, I he, loved him. Here, here's a question: mm-hmm. uh, What was the Marx Brothers to you? The Marx Brothers' worst film? 
Wow. Well, do we we don't do we don't count Love Happy? Do we consider it not a marketable film? I, mean, I don't even I don't consider that. I mean, I they're can, not they're not even in any scenes together. No. So I'm going to say that one for me. Uh, gosh, it's uh, I think Go West is up there for me. Uh, room service. I'm going to say room service. I remember feeling nauseous. Well, I felt, oh I, yeah, yeah. It's it was, bad. I remember going because you know I used to set the clock and put you know an alarm clock, put it under my pillow to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to catch you know, room service or love happy or whatever. So imagine my disappointment at 2 a.m. when room service comes on. Of course. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm 12 years old, you know, and, and this is back when you had the TV guide and you're circling. Uh, yes, that, uh, yes. <laughs> of course. You know, Abbott the Marx, Costello, right? you, you, could, you could catch a Marx Brothers, the Marx Brothers, but they would trot them out at Christmas time. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think on Christmas Eve is the is when I saw Horse Feathers, which was my introduction. Your introduction oh. was A Day at the Races. That's such a great I, I said to Gilbert last night, I'm going to ask Frank, if he had turned on the TV and room service came on instead of Day at the Races, would we even be having this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's so true. And a lot of folks aren't crazy about later. those. Uh, a lot of folks aren't crazy about the, the, you know, the MGM films. But there are scenes on A Day at the Races that are, it's a Florida call. That whole thing he does, he's so great in that the uh, the exam scene, the medical exam scene. Sure. I mean, the, he's... he's to but, Tootsie Fruitsy ice cream. The tootsie, that Wait. was the first thing. I remember going home after uh, going to bed that night, and I shared a room with my brother, reenacting the Tootsie Fruitsy. I, I'm getting a pretty good Tootsie Fruitsy. You know, that whole... That, you can't beat that. And I, 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 just, Wait, I just... And my poor brother, I'd make him be Chico, my younger brother, and it was... <laughs> <laughs> when, when I... Although, you know, the funny thing is... People think of uh, A Night at the Opera as the greatest Marx Brothers picture. But to me, it had a lot of, you know, funny moments. Mm -hmm. But I thought that always struck me as the beginning of the end. I I agree with you. What's your favorite, Gilbert and and Frank? Uh, Duck Soup. Yeah, me too. My my favorite, and it's turning 90 in August, I'm glad you asked, is Horse Feathers. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. horse feathers is great too. Yeah. yeah. Those those are those are back to back for me. I'd have to well, say. Well, because they're because they're total anarchy. Absolutely. You know, and and you don't have Thalberg putting them in service of a love interest. Yeah, and Groucho's brutal in it, which is what I what I love. What this well, stuff you, with, you like when he's in, when he's an authority figure. I do. I love yeah, when he's you in like charge. You like when he's in charge of down. something. And I love when he's taking down Dumont. You know, I can see it right now in the kitchen bending over a hot stove, but I can't see the stove. I mean, what's I mean, what's more insulting than that line? It's great, and that the rat a tat tat, just the deadpan rat a tat tat. It's just like it's chillingly wonder. It's I've never seen anyone like him. You and, know, and, and it was funny. It's like in Duck Soup, mm-hmm. where he's like prosecuting uh, Chico, and then uh-huh. for no reason whatsoever, he goes on to defend him just because it's <laughs> funny. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Chicolini. He stands it. <laughs> a pitiable object. Let's see you get out of that one. That, I love that whole that whole yes. that, that whole trail. It's great. <laughs> and of course, the great to war number is it's just spectacular. Uh, that, that's that's but, I mean that's that's the edgiest, smartest Marx Brothers oh, yeah. movie. That's that's the Marx Brothers movie that that is that is, that is probably the most satirical, if we can use that word. Yeah. I, you know, I, Gilbert and I have a love hate relationship with the MGM films. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, but there there are you know and when you bring up the Tootsie first and you bring up those scenes I'm I'm transported back to Annabelle's books uh-huh. to the to the the screen captures oh, yeah. and the and the dialogue in those yeah, books Wyatt Duck. yeah Wyatt and Duck. Wyatt Before, Duck before there were VHS tapes we had Wyatt Duck That's yeah right <laughs> that book remember that so we'd have the little photos with the quotes and that was like oh my God this is this isn't happening I'm holding a Marx Brothers movie in my hand with Wyatt Duck it was the best and. Um, but you know, in defense of a night at the opera, since I when I do the show, sometimes they'll couple it with a screening. If I'm on the road doing a one nighter, you know, I might be in Riverside, California. They'll show Duck Soup before. But night at the opera on the big screen with a thousand people. I saw it once at the Orpheum in downtown Los Angeles. You, I understood why that film was is revered. All the laughs are right in those little in the on those quiet moments. It's weird to watch it on television. It's it's off putting in a way because they're taking their time for the laughs. As you know, it was all timed out. When you're in your living room or you're dying wherever, there's no. That's all, what bothers yeah. me about those pictures, though. Yes. It's like with horse feathers, duck soup, monkey business. It they it was machine gun. Absolutely, one joke after the other, and that's what I loved so much. Agreed. About it. Oh, relentless. He's relentless. Uh, agreed. Plus, yeah. you have Zeppo. And nothing against, we just had Jack <laughs> Jones on the show last week. So, yeah. I have, with apologies to Jack and, and, and Alan Jones, mm-hmm. I need Zeppo. Uh, 
I'm yes. With you. I'm with you. I love you know, Sokol. I need the four of them because mm-hmm. because there's a dynamic between the four of them and that, that Alan Jones was not able to to replicate. I agree. You know, Robert Bader is writing his biography, Zeppos, and it's fascinating. Uh, it, well, know, every, everything Robert writes is so good and yeah, so exhaustively researched. I, Absolutely. I, I was uh, I always Without think about bench. this, uh, like the Three Stooges, mm-hmm. they, they felt bad that in the height of their career, they were just doing shorts. Mm-hmm. But it's like the shorts get shown all the time now. And much more people know who the Stooges are than uh, than the Marx Brothers. Yeah, it bothers it bothers me too because when we were kids, you, you know, there would have there'd be Marx Brother Week in L.A. Three channels, four channels, and from Monday through Friday, Channel Five, KTLA, you can see the Paramount films. Eight o'clock, prime time. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we're weaned on that. And then at eleven, you can watch You Bet Your Life. And then any other time, you can see so you you can see old Groucho being interviewed on on some talk show so you're getting we got the three ages of groucho in 1974 75 76 but that's gone now there's so much competition out there and you know that's why i hope that i like doing this show gilbert and frank because i feel it's kind of a mission it's missionary work i lo- there was a time i thought you know maybe enough 15 years ago and then that changed i thought no this is this is really this means something to me and i'm converting audiences and you it, are you have to be and it's it's yeah and and uh they're they're appreciating the style of his humor, you know. And they and if they see my show, maybe they'll go see Duck Soup. Maybe they'll watch Groucho and you and on YouTube and You Bet Your Life. And I, I care about that because, like you guys, I I I'm crazy about him. So yeah, it's it's like kind of like with your show, you were noticing younger and younger people discovering uh-huh. the Marx Brothers, and it's like, and on this podcast, I I always love when I'll get a tweet that says. I had no idea who that person was, but I've been looking up all of his stuff now, and I'm a big fan now. Yeah, we get a lot of those. Like somebody Robert. wrote to us early on and said, "I didn't know who Barbara Felden was because oh, they were gosh. only they were only like 25." Uh, but thank you for turning me on to these people's body of work, and that's what you're doing. I heard you say that you're you're performing for the grandchildren of, uh, if not the great grandchildren of Gracho's original audience. Oh God, yeah, that's true. But talking about the movies, Frank. And, and you said something very interesting about Groucho and L.B. Mayer when they were at MGM. Yeah, I mean, Groucho could certainly self-sabotage. There's a, that great story I love, and uh, they're, doing, they're, they're filming A Day at the Races, and uh, Louis B. Mayer comes on the set of A Day at the Races and says to Groucho, uh, 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 Hello, Groucho, how's the picture going? And Groucho goes, That's none of your business, Mayer. We're working for Ivan Thalberg. Three days later, Irving Thalberg died, and they were working for Louis B. Mayer. But that, <laughs> that right. was Groucho. <laughs> who had, who had it out for them? <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah. Groucho had this tendency to—we to, We loved him when he was uh, brash and insulting on and, and the films, but uh, in real life, it's, it doesn't quite work the same. That I think his relationships were sometimes impacted by his in, inability to, to filter. And, um, and we saw that as he got older, too. And, sure. I think sure. Know, at the end, it was like it was a combination of illness— and being 85, and he had the gig as Groucho. He didn't have to prove himself, and he, I don't think he cared as much what, anymore. What do you think would have happened? And Gilbert describes the MGM films as the beginning of the end. What do you think would have happened? And it's pure speculation. Had Thalberg not died suddenly, they'd have stayed at MGM making at least quality pictures with a budget. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and, and perhaps they would have been, you know, they would have been better scripts, better directors, yeah, uh, better experience. Um, you know. A day at the races. It, t- it, it took a lot of wind out of their sails, particularly yeah. gra- particularly Groucho's. In a day at the races is a, is a little flabby because uh, I don't know if Thalberg was around. Was he there for post production? I don't I'm not know. Sure, you know, to like tighten it up and. But uh, hey, wouldn't we have liked to have had a few more, you know, monkey businesses and horse feathers? I know I would have. Of course, but, or but had even, they just stayed in Paramount longer? You yeah. know, you f- you forget they only made thirteen films. Right. Not not that you forget. People forget. Give us a little bit. Gilbert will love this. Give us a couple of bars of that song that you do in the show, which is cut from which was cut from a day at the races. The Hackenbush song. Oh, yeah. My name is Dr. Hackenbush, the famous medico. You're welcome, Dr. Hackenbush. If that's the case, I'll go. Oh, no, you mustn't go. Who said I mustn't go? The only reason that I came was so that I can go. 
I'm sure that you would like to hear some facts about my great career. Although my horn I hate to blow, there's one thing that you are to an owl. I'm Dr. Hackenbush, as all my friends will verify. Well, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dr. Hackenbush. I'm Dr. Hackenbush. I'm Dr. Hackenbush. You never would guess, but nevertheless, I'm Dr. Hackenbush. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's Calmar and, Ruby. And I love the, I think there's... Didn't make uh, it into the film. For ailments abdominal, his charges <laughs> are nominal. Though it's great for, there's a rate for tonsillectomy. Sick and healthy, poor and wealthy, come direct to me. Oh, I yeah, did. <laughs> That's it. Oh, God bless you. They yell when oh, I yeah. send them home. Well, but they never know. They never send a check to me. <laughs> and I, 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 I mean, that kind of that wit is great. Calmar, Calmar, and Ruby. Right, right Calmar and Ruby, of But course. I love the end of that song. With the possible exception of your mother and your father and your sisters and your brothers and your nephews and your nieces and your uncles and your cousins, whom you number by the dozens, a doctor's a man's best friend. Yippee! You know, he was just... Why, why did they cut that out? Yeah, I, I was have, just going to ask that. I have no idea. It sorely lacks a Groucho number. I love any time Groucho sings, as you yes. do. You guys do. And that's yeah. what I love. That's what's fun about my show. I love to sing novelty songs. And I sing in other shows I do, but I love being able to sing, you know, Father's Day. And I sing, I sing them the, in Titwillow. I sing Gallagher and Sheen. I sing Her Ever Gavin Spaulding. I sing uh, Hail Fredonia. I sing uh, Show Me a Rose. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 whatever, whatever it is, I'm against it. Whatever it is, the, I'm against the, it. Yeah. The right. one moment I remember talking to Miriam, mm -hmm. and that was felt magical to me. Is she? Uh, she mentioned, you know, uh, Gallagher and Sheen. Is this Miriam or Maxine? Uh, uh, Miriam. 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 I mean, yeah, gracias. She 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 mentioned Gallagher and Sheen, and uh, and I put my hand out and I said, "Absolutely, Mister Gallagher." And she grabs my hand, and shakes it, and she goes, "Positively, Mister Sheen." <laughs> That's and great. I felt like I traveled. Back to old vaudeville. What's, That's what's, great. What's better than that? You know, she would leave messages on my machine, and she'd be well into her 80s, and she'd sing Show Me a Rose, just, and that's it. Oh. For no, for no, <laughs> I mean, horribly <laughs> off key. <laughs> show me a rose, and I'll show you a good Frank. Frank, I love you. I'm just calling to say hi. Show me a rose, or leave <laughs> me alone. That's it was great. It was, and I've got all those on my voicemail oh, still. Oh, that's you know? great. Really, Groucho's daughter. We will return to Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. But first, a word from our sponsor. Andrew LaPosha, a question from a fan, uh, yes. a, a very loyal fan of this show. Does Frank have an opinion? We were just talking about Groucho on Joys, mm -hmm. which Frank said he, uh, <laughs> we were talking before we turned the mics on. Frank saw, Gilbert and I only found out about it later, but Frank mm -hmm. saw it, it, I guess, when it aired in 1976. Mm -hmm. But Andrew wants to know, do you also have an opinion on Groucho and Skidoo? Well... <laughs> Which is where he's not, he's not quite so compromised as he was in Joyce. You, know, you know, I kind of get a kick out of that last scene with Austin Pendleton. He's yeah, got we, had, little, we had Austin here talking about it. I know, and he had that yeah. little joint. Oh, pump, pumpkin. And then, <laughs> that was it, right? Is yeah. that what he says at the end? He yeah. takes a little uh, toke of the, of the joint and just says, pumpkin. And that's, that's it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've seen it once, and that was plenty. But I love it. It's so surreal. I mean... I mean, you love that. We all love the players, Gleason and Channing. And the list goes on. But boy, you know yeah. what? <laughs> he liked a, he liked a big check, and uh, he you know he felt he was part of the landscape still. I, I get why someone approaching eighty take, takes the gig, and you got Otto Preminger directing. But I'm not sure he read the script. <laughs> yeah. And but, and Joyce, do you want to say anything about Groucho oh, and Joyce? God, I was so excited when it was you know I was in the in, in the the heat of my Mark's passion. And uh, I couldn't. I was so happy that Groucho Marx is going to be on television, was surrounded by these other comedians who, I, in my opinion, couldn't touch him in terms of skill and talent. But here was the funniest man in the world is is going to be on TV. I love him. And then uh, at the very top of the show, everyone introduces themselves: Desi <laughs> Arnaz and you know, and Mickey Rooney, whoever was on it, Bab Hope, and, and everybody very, was on you know, it. Everyone's on that show. There's like a hundred of them. Jerry but Colonna. I, and then they turn to Groucho with his cockeyed, with his kind of ha cockeyed uh, hat, baseball cap, and he just goes something like, "Groucho Mark." <laughs> <laughs> and I, 
<laughs> he didn't have the strength to complete his shit. To put the X in. <laughs> so, <laughs> to pluralize more. Oh, it was, it was, it was, oh, my heart sank. And you're going, yes. no, 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 this isn't happening. Uh, it was a life, little life lesson what happens to human beings toward the end. But uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, he, had, he still had those great, great moments. Uh, it, it, once in a while, even at the at the very end, you know, I met I met George Fenneman. He came to he came to my show at the Pasadena Playhouse. Oh, do and, tell. As yeah, the George was, Fenneman of this podcast, I ins- the, I insist that you uh, that you tell this. You got it. I bow before the Mr. Santo. By the way. Oh, you're too kind. But uh, I was doing uh, the Groucho show where I play him from 15 to 85. The one Arthur wrote, and and George Fenneman shows up at the performance. He's in house seats. Now, I'm in my late 20s at this time, and I keep saying that, but I was young, and I, I couldn't believe that George Fenneman, I used to sneak out of my bedroom at 11 o'clock at night and watch reruns of You Bet Your Life when I was a kid. And now he's in the audience. And I get to introduce him at the very end. And i done a bit from You Bet Your Life. I just did this farewell as old Groucho, you know, good night, Hopper, good night, Chico. You know, I'm doing all that. And it's, it's a moving piece, and at the end, I get to introduce... George Fenneman. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest here. He is he worked with Groucho Marx for 14 years from 1947 to 1961. Every week, and every week he introduced Groucho with this. And here he is, the one, the only, and the whole audience knows to go, Groucho. Now this is 30 years after You Bet Your Life has been on the air. And um, I say, here he is, the male Margaret Dumont, Mr. George <laughs> M- Mr. George Fenneman. And and the audience stands up for George. And they applaud George. They remember. It's not that far off from when he was that, that sidekick. And I look at Mr. Fenneman, and he's teary-eyed. He's moved by the evening. He's moved by the event. And he comes back to my dressing room later, and he says to me, Frank, would you like to hear about the last time I saw Groucho? So I would love to hear the story. And he proceeds to tell me the story about driving to Beverly Hills uh, and uh, to Groucho Marx's home on Hillcrest. And... Um, he goes into Groucho's bedroom, and there is Groucho Marx in a wheelchair. He's got the glasses, the beret, and, um, but, uh, and he's had a couple strokes at the time. And, and, but George described Groucho's appearance to me, his expression to me, as beatific. He was um, serene after this long life. And at the end of this joyful, joyous encounter, Fenneman, Mr. Fenneman tells me he's got to move Groucho from Groucho's wheelchair to Groucho's bed. So George told me, he put his arms around Groucho's torso and he lifts Groucho out of the wheelchair and he starts to shimmy him toward the bed. And in this tiny voice, Fenneman hears, Fenneman, you always were a lousy dancer. That's great. Love it. That's great. It's so so sweet. I I think there was genuine love between those two guys. That's interesting that you hear stories, you know, Groucho was, you know, was not an easy guy to get along with but George loved him from 1947 until you know for 30 years and he yeah. was there for him and uh, Fenneman you always were a lousy dancer what a great I, what a great line though you know great. In, 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 and I think about that as a life lesson it's like oh yeah you can be in hell your body can be shot your brain's going humor is what carries the day for Groucho no matter what I mean it's humiliating it's embarrassing he's compromised I, but he's still had a I, joke yeah. I remember I once heard a story I, I think it was Dick Cabot who told it, that uh, Groucho was once taking a flight by himself, and it was delayed, everything that could go wrong. It was delayed, it was bumpy, uh, the the luggage was getting lost, everything, and he was, you know, just, he couldn't stand it. He had it wanted to get out of there. And some woman came up to him and she said, you're Groucho Marx, aren't you? And he, like, just nods his head, and she said, well, you weren't very funny on the flight. And Groucho says, Hey, lady, why don't you go fuck yourself? <laughs> There's that Groucho wit. I love uh, Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's like when, uh, it's a, when he was in London and he was in a, in a, in a cab and, um, and there was traffic because there was some event for the Queen. And he says to the cat, what's going on here? Well, you know, the, the queen has, a, has, a, has an event here. And she goes, and Groucho goes, oh, fuck the queen. And the, and, <laughs> and the, and the, and the cat rabbit goes, you could barely approach her. <laughs> 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 Gra- 
Groucho There's tells an, that story. That's great. Know? That's great. Here's a yeah. question from another fan, Jimmy Angelina, our mm. friend, and happy birthday, Jimmy, who's uh, the uh, co-author of the uh, Be Italian, a book that we promoted on this show. If mm-hmm. you guys could travel back in time, and we'll direct this to Frank, and could only see one Marx Brothers show live, which would it be? Uh, including the earliest vaudeville and road show and and the road show test for the films, and thanks so much for keeping Groucho's cigar flame burning. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you for that. I think we all are here. Those 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 who are listening and those who are doing this. Well, right now. you're you're doing the heavy lifting, my friend. But we <laughs> but, but we we try. I appreciate it. Now, for me, I would love to because there's no record of it. We've seen what was kind of the coconuts, even though it's not really reflective totally of the of the stage show. I mean, that was a three-and-a-half-hour extravaganza with huge numbers. And you mean I'll say she is? Uh, but, no, I'm saying coconuts was. We've oh, seen coconuts. 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 We've, coconuts. Se- we've seen animal crackers, but I would want to see I'll say she is would be the one to see because right. there's no record of it. There just isn't. And, uh, in, and to see them in their early to mid-30s ripping it up, and it has more of a variety vibe to it, I would have loved to have seen that. It still holds the record for most weeks uh, from the wall at the Walnut Street Theater, and that theater has been around since 1809. So it played for months, and it was the it's the it, that's how successful they were, and that's the show that catapulted them to to yeah. Broadway. To Broadway. I, I'd love to see it too, wouldn't you, Gil? Oh yeah. Yeah, but of course, I, now that he mentions it, I'd also love to see them on the road working out stuff for the MGM pictures. Oh yeah, that would have been fascinating. Oh, what? another story that Miriam told. Was that you know she used to, she used to travel with them sometimes when they'd be trying out their stuff mm-hmm. on the road, mm-hmm. and uh, and you know she you know she was their daughter she didn't care it was like she was a kid, and uh, so they were doing a show and she was just outside running around and ignoring their show, and then afterwards Chico said to her. Well, did you catch it? And she says, what? And and Chico and Harpo had switched parts. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and she missed that. Yes. That reminds me of this time. That's, I love that story, Gilbert. That's great. The time That's where great. Uh, Groucho had appendicitis and he couldn't go on. And Zeppo went on for Groucho as Captain Spaulding on the road in Animal Crackers. It's a yeah, true story. Yeah, that's another famous one. And Zeppo went on. And killed it, and uh, and uh, <laughs> Groucho was not happy about it either. Yeah, he goes. But Zeppo, you know, as they said, had they always. Everyone says he had the. He was the funniest of all the brothers, and I think, and I, I want one example of that. I, you know, no one's ever quoted a story or a one-liner from Zeppo, and I think. The book that comes out on him will, will maybe shine well, a little light on Well, if anybody it. can shine a light on that, it's Bader. Yeah, yeah. Uh, t- uh, you mentioned the Walnut Theater. Uh, mm-hmm. How many of these venues, where the Marxists did, I'll say she is, and you're going to be there uh, next week, tomorrow? I'll be there. I'm leaving tomorrow. I have a, I have a matinee uh, Saturday. We, it's like, here's another great thing. There's going to be a, thou- there's sou- a thousand tickets have sold to see some guy slap on makeup and emulating a comedian that's been dead for 45 years. That makes me happy that pe- there's still a 1,000 people of course. that give a damn about this thing yeah. and, and, and kind of know the show. I'm a regular at the Walnut Street there. I've directed a lot there, and I've performed a lot there and other stuff. Makes us happy, too. And, but it's, but, but I, I, th- I'll Say She Is was 1923. I did Groucho Life and Review there. First time I worked there was in 1993. And afterward, a man came up to me and said, 70 years ago, I saw the Marx Brothers at the Walnut Street Theater. The guy was 87 years old, and he'd seen I'll Say She Is. And he said, I watched Harpo drop knives on the exact same spot that other act, that actor who played Harpo dropped knives. It was, it was so wonderful. It was, it was, it, they're they're wow. close. So I played, wow. a, I played so many of these theaters. I play, you know, I played, I just played my hometown. I did 99th Theater. I played 2,000 theaters with the show. Played it in the round. Played it in, you know, in the universities, performing arts centers, vaudeville palaces. The Lyric Theater in Allentown is one that was great. Um, I played did, did one. They, did they play that one, the Lyric? They played the Lyric. That's actually the first place they did I'll yeah. Say She Is. It was like a split week. It was supposed to be. It was going to be a few days. You know, it was a few days. At, it was a break-in, actually. They were going to break it in, in in Allentown and take it to Philly, and then it ran forever in Philadelphia, and people went, you know, Philadelphians went not. You know, Philly audiences love love them. There's this, uh, there's a, and Groucho went back. In 1974, this is 50 years later, he was doing the Mike Douglas show. I remember seeing that, too, in 74. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Groucho went back explicitly 
uh, to see the Walnut Street Theater. He did the Mike Douglas show and made a point of going back to the, the scene of their, their major victory. He had a sentimental uh, connection to the Walnut Street Theater. And for any, any of your listeners, um, uh, you know, they should check it out if you're in Philadelphia. Because it's a, hu- a hundred <coughs> years since Alsatia is. Can you believe that? It's insane. Wow. Yeah. 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 What, is it, what does it feel like to you personally? when you And you, you told me that story about, I think it was the theater in Galesburg, Illinois. Yes. Where you can still see the grease paint. Yeah, it was actually. The, uh, <clears throat> I played uh, the Ellen Theater in Bozeman, and oh, Gallag- Bozeman, sorry. And, yeah, no, it's and I think it's the most complete vaudeville palace I've ever been in, in that it's all it's all gilt, it's all detailed. It's the only theater I've ever played in that actually still had the placards, where they have the name of the acts for vaudeville, and then you have a number next to it, and your program would correspond with the number, and so you can see follow what's going along. They still had uh, g- gas lamps in there in the dressing rooms, <clears throat> the fixtures. But underneath, Gallagher and Sheen worked there in 1925, and so now I'm doing my Groucho show there. And in the dressing room, under the dressing tables, there are streaks of makeup, black, white, and red, from all those vaudevillians from the 20s, 30s. And I added my own grease paint there just to be part of that tradition. But I've never seen anything like that. that that's like, about, it's, it's like an archa- that? Yeah, it's like going into an archaeological dig. I, I couldn't it believe is. it. By the way, could Gilbert uh, tour as old Groucho? Oh, <laughs> do, do, I do you think? I, do you I, think? I, I love that oh. imitation. He likes I, it, Gil. He, he's listening to the it. show. Are you kidding? I was listening again today. I remember the first time I heard it was probably, I don't know, 12 years ago. And it kind of took, it took my breath away because you were doing what we were all thinking. And at first, because I feel like he's my grandfather, like we all do, went, <gasps> It took me back, you know. I go, oh no! And then I thought, oh, this is such a place of love and knowledge and 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 pain, you know. Because you know, it's exactly what you're saying, Gilbert. We didn't want to see this happen to this god. He's Superman. Of course, to me, he's Superman. And it's like, you know, it's like age was his kryptonite, you know. And it, and he held in there a long time. Um, but I love, I love when you do it. <laughs> yes, it's it's a crowd pleaser. Oh, maybe it would maybe it would please the fans if you guys tried to have a little bit of a dialogue or a conversation between younger Groucho and older Groucho. You want to attempt that? <laughs> you know, I can't wait to see. How I'm going to tie out one day. I can only imagine what that might be like. Me well, in my later years. Well, what did you, what did you consider your later years? <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, Anything over, uh, what? How old are you anyway, Groucho? Old Groucho? Uh, let's, let's see. Uh, I was uh, when I was born. There were still dinosaurs. And uh, so, what? What was a dinosaur? <laughs> well, I know a dinosaur, <laughs> but it was something that I'd cover my eyes for. <laughs> I worked with dinosaur. <laughs> Back in the 1940s, we could also alternate on uh, uh, on. Uh, Hello, I must be going. I cannot say. I came to say, I must be going. I'm glad I came. Was just the same. I must be going. <laughs> I'll stay a week or two. I'll, I'll stay, stay the summer, summer through. through. But, but I am telling you, I must, must be, be going. going. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> the, I love the. I, I love. The, I love when you do the uh, explaining the self evidence. That's my favorite thing. Back oh. in my day, this is one of my Back one of the. In my what, day, there was an audience. And an audience were people who would watch a show. <laughs> and, and back in my day, a show was something that they do on stage, and the audience would watch this because they were the audience. <laughs> I, I, I was I, thought, this is surreal for me, watching the two of you guys well, go. I always thought a recreation of the Carnegie Hall concert would have been fun to do at some point you know yeah yeah this is a question i've always wanted to ask you frank but so a Mm -hmm. fan asked it Mm -hmm. dan rodden how often does frank see websites and articles that accidentally use a picture of him instead of the real groucho happens all the time and it's (laughs) irritating i found one today (laughs) well people think that i'm behind it like that gives me pleasure to to be identified as the real deal i love the real deal 
Right. So I don't, I don't want to see my photo in place of his. He's the guy. There's only one Groucho. I'm just a guy who's filtering him and sharing him. And it's, a, it's like what Hal Holbrook does with Mark Twain. <laughs> I want to give the experience of what it may have been like to spend a 90-minute you know, evening with, with Groucho. And a show that he, he never did a one-person show, Groucho Marx. So this show is my fantasy. It's a fantasia. So I'm pretty much doing what I think that I, you know, a fan would enjoy. Songs, stories, yeah. one-liners, inter- you know, harassing my piano player, harassing the audience, bringing people on stage, jumping off of couches, jumping off the stage. Um, but that's a show. That's my own take. That's my... That's what I have to offer. But if you want to see Groucho, there's only one Groucho. I mean, I've never claimed to be that. And, you of know, course. And, and, uh, but I, I, say, I always say, hey, if you want to see Groucho, go watch Duck Soup, watch You Bet Your Life, and see the funniest man in the world. Which, what, which by the way, you mentioned Hal Holbrook. You dedicated the, uh, the new show. Well, I love to, to, you know. To I, your friend Hal Holbrook. I did. You know, when I was developing the show in college, I didn't know what the hell a solo show was, an historic solo show. I'd seen Gabe. And I thought, well, I'd, I want to do this. So that was part of my senior project. And, of course, I mentioned the Elaine Stritch connection. Yeah. And uh, so I went out to see every one-person show I could see in L.A. County. So I saw a one-person Dorothy Parker show in a 99-seat theater. I saw my someone who beca- ended up becoming a good friend of mine, um, Eddie Carroll, had an impeccable Jack Benny one-man show. I saw it at the Mayfair in Santa Monica. And we ended up working together in a production of The Odd Couple as me as... Groucho as Oscar and him as Felix as Jack as Jack Benny as Felix. Okay, it's convoluted. Point wow. was Jack. So he did a great Jack Benny. I saw Jack Klugman, who I adore, uh, play Lyndon B. Johnson. And this was a time in the mid '80s where these these historical one person shows were fairly they were prolific. They were out there everywhere. There, uh, James Whitmore was doing Give Him Hell Harry and and Bully as Ted as Teddy Roosevelt and. Julie, Julie Harris was doing Bell of Amherst. They, they were out there. And then you had great other one-person shows, not historical. You had Billy Tomlin and Leguizamo and, and Bogosian. Yeah. But, the, but the granddaddy of them all was Hal Holbrook, who I saw while I was studying, you know, putting together the show, trying to understand what I'm supposed to do. So I went to Citrus College in Glendora, and there is 1,400 seats packed, and one man on stage in a white suit. It's 1984. And I'm just blown away. I'm going, how is he holding a how's he holding an audience? One guy. He's not singing. He's not dancing. He's 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 it's a, it's monologizing, if that's a word. He is reading from you know Huck Finn and all of his r- r- short stories, and it's it's compelling. And afterward, and some of it, it was a little dense for me at the time. I, did, I didn't know much about Twain. And I was getting an education. And, and if you see the the power of Twain and how he used humor to satirize society and et cetera. And afterward, I, I went backstage, and I had him sign my, my poster, and he signed it. 30 years later, it's eight, nine, what, 2014, I read his book, Harold, which you guys should read. Okay. Every, I mean, everyone who is listening. Uh, next to Moss Hart's Act One, it's, it's one of the best showbiz books. Uh, the make, how, do you, how you make a show, how do you, how do you break in a show. It's very moving, and I'm reading the book, Hal Holbrook's memoir, and I'm getting teary, and I'm moved, I'm relating to him about the fragmented existence of, you know, of, that comes with touring, about trying to make people uh, pay attention when you are outdoors, trying to get focused, trying to uh-huh. make people believe that what, what you have matters, trying to convince people that Groucho or, or Twain matter, making them relevant, making them care about these entities that no longer exist. So I related to Hal, and um, he comes from nothing. He was abandoned as a child. He literally was left in his, his playpen when he was like two years old. His parents left him and his diapers, his soiled diapers. And they Did took you off. know that, Gil, about Hal Holbrook? No. Yeah. No, his story yeah. is... You Sad. Know, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. He's a fighter. He's a relentless beast. And here's what I love about Hal. He was doing that show. He did that show for 62 years consecutively. Unreal. And, and the last... I saw him, and he stopped in 2017 when he was 92, he died four years later at, at 90, almost 96, and I was at his 95th birthday party. So my point is, I see him, I said, I have to meet him. I have to get to know Hal Holbrook. This is like what I did with Groucho and Burl and all these guys. I just feel compelled to, like, gravitate to the masters. And so I sent a note backstage, and it got to him, and he came back afterward and said, I, I loved your, your, your note, Frank. And I was, and uh, I love how you believe in the tradition of the theater and et cetera, and, give me a hug and I invited him to my show and the next year he came to see me do Groucho in 2007 years ago 
and he loved it. And he, he re-signed the poster 30 years later. Wow. Something, something like, uh, you're, uh, you're an original, he said. Which is, when you're, when you're performing to someone else, that's what you want to hear. You don't want to hear... How lovely. You don't want to hear your good, you know, good imitation. You want to hear that you're bringing something original to the, the, the portrayal. And then Hal and I hit it off. And we wrote each other, and I would go have lunch with him. And again, I'd pick his brain. And um, the, the best... And the, the one thing that stays with me that he said to me, this is, can you imagine 62 years he did the show? He said, keep it going, Frank, keep it going. And then he said to me, do it every year consecutively. So you can say, well, even, even if it's one time that you do the show, you can say that you've done it every year for how many years? This is my 38th year doing That's the great. show since 1984. He was a beautiful man. That's uh, great. He was I'm, elegant... sorry we didn't, I'm sorry we didn't have him here. Oh, me too. He was... He's, yeah. one of, he's a great, great brain, and the, the stories he had. I mean, that's a, that's a career that is, you know, larger than life, something that you can only wish to have, you know. Um, but he made me feel good. I said, Frank, film is fine, TV's fine, but there's nothing like the theater. And you're a theater guy, and I'm a theater guy, and you know what I mean, Frank. Wonderful. He made Praise me from Caesar. Yeah, yeah, he was the best. What is being owner of, uh, of Groucho Marx Productions? What does that entail, Frank? Uh, I, I am an owner of this company that was pretty much be- which was bequeathed to me by, by Groucho's kids, Arthur and Miriam. And it represents the name and likeness of Groucho Marx. So this shirt mm-hmm. that I'm wearing has been authorized by that company. And I'm new to the position, and I'm, part of it is trying to keep Groucho present, whether it's commercially, right. getting, you know, whatever that means, and in, in, in products and... And also supervise, you know, being part of any projects that come about. Hopefully, uh, that's what it means. Um, it, it's licensing it's of Groucho merchandise and, and so forth. And uh, you yeah. know, I, I hope I've got another generation to work on. I'm in my fifties, uh, so I hope I can uh, make a, make a difference. Keep him, you know, through his company. He he started that company. It's Groucho Marx's company that he formed with Aaron Fleming in 1974. So, you know, you see him dancing with Paul Abdul in a Coca-Cola commercial or, or whatever. Right. All those things right. that happen, you know, slot machines. and It's just a way of keeping him present. What, a, uh, what an honor that the kids bequeath that to you. It is. Uh, and they know that I, that I care about him and that, that uh, I'm, I'm a, probably a good choice. So, you know, we're still trying to come up with ways to keep him present. The show, this show is one way to do it, the show that I do. do this podcast is a way of keeping him alive. He never dies. But well, um, we try. We may be doing this for 38 consecutive years, right, Gilbert? <laughs> <laughs> the way we're going, and that's just oh, today. And that's I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do some. Uh, let's let's shout out to your director of the live show, Drea. Yes, Drea uh, Weber directed the film and edited the film, and I think what sets it apart, and if I haven't mentioned it, was that the show was filmed. With all with a handheld camera as well, three cameras, but one was. It a looks hand- great, by the way. I have to say, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she was literally on the stage behind me, uh, behind my shoulder, getting into the audience when I was doing the improv with the crowd, the crowd work. And so it doesn't feel like a typical, you know, unless you're Hamilton where you have millions of dollars and you've got like cranes and stuff. But I'm proud of this, the little show that could. And she shot it beautifully and and edited it beautifully. And I, I'm proud of it. And she, you know, she's a terrific director. I'd been doing it for, I don't know, 20 something years. And she said, you know, this is a good show, Frank, but I think you could do more. Bring Groucho's. Bring his smarts to it. Talk about what made him tick. Talk about the fact that he never made it past the sixth grade and became this reader, that he had a friendship with T.S. Eliot. Mm-hmm. Sing Titwillow, which I do now on the show, because yeah. it shows that he has... a nice moment, too. He has this intelligence. He has this breath to him that's not just, yada da 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 one morning a shot. She knew that I needed to give it some more depth and texture and... Because Groucho is a complicated man, and it's a complicated persona. You know, the reason we're, I think we imitate him is because there's so much to it. It's not just the lecherous guy. It's just not. It's not just the insulting guy. He's got a voice that goes from falsetto to bass. He's got a. a, a he's an athlete. He can. He, he's. He's a dancer. Uh, when he dances in. A, in. A, is it? I think it's a, a day at the races when he's doing that Charleston with Esther Muir. Uh, when he's you know, you know you know when he's change of partners and, and he was with Dumont and they go back and forth. Yeah. He's he's incredible. It's like he's he's like, a good dancer. We see him dancing on that desk in horse feathers. Oh my yeah, he's and of course the famous corkscrew leg dance. <laughs> yeah, what what do you call that? The corkscrew leg. It's you're very cor- you're very good at it. Well, yeah, and I don't do it exactly like him, but it's close enough, and uh, it, it it it's the illusion is there. 
But it, it, I, I've seen old scripts from from those touring shows, and it says, "Does the does the corkscrew dance? Does the mechanical man dance?" Which is when he puts his arms, you know, in you know, kind of in a circular motion as he shimmies across. And there were actually these were actually dance moves of the time. Um, but part of the re- researching those guys is always fun. I've done six different productions of Animal Crackers throughout the country at, at really great theaters like Good Speed Opera House and and Paper Mill Playhouse and Arena Stage and and. To play Groucho when you have like a 25-person cast around you and a 20-person orchestra, and you get to sing "Hooray for Captain Spaulding," that's a that's a that's a bit of a fantasy. It was really. That's fun. great. I got a fan here, Lucifer mm-hmm. Sam. He said, "My wife and I were lucky enough to see Frank in an incredible production of Animal Crackers at the Good Speed Opera House <laughs> back in 1992." That's right. There you go. I love it. I love it. That was one of my favorite productions of that show, and I had a director named Charlie Rappoli. Who did did uh, on stage on Broadway? He played the uh, Eddie Cantor role in Whoopi. So he was a performer, a musical comedy performer. So he knew how to deal with guys like me. So if if he would literally show you at times, you know, I love when an actor, when a director ends up showing you bits because it's it, shows like that are complicated, or farcical. So he had great empathy for for me because he's he'd done it, and uh, I loved watching him in the uh, in the uh, rehearsals, mouthing every character and taking on their expressions and. He was, he, had, he was an empath, he, so it was an excellent production. I hope you get to play Gil, uh, Groucho at some point, Gilbert, maybe in the remake of Joys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gil, Gil, Gilbert, I'm, I'm going to drag you up on stage if you ever come visit me, and we'll do some dueling old Grouchos. Or, or I'll just yeah. give you, or just going to give you the spotlight. Forget dueling. Just make it. You, you, you own it. It's yours. Do it. It'll be the coda to the show. I'm bringing you up. What are you doing? Uh, what are you doing in April? I'll be in New Jersey, in Morristown, and Red Bank. Come by. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. That, that's got... like I said. That's as big a compliment as you could get. Uh, there you uh, go. I would love to see you guys do something on stage together, uh, well, or have, I would have definitely... Groucho come out as as uh, Groucho could also uh, uh, Groucho Gilbert come out. Gilbert could also come out and be Sig Ruman. Give us the plugs. Uh... Frank, before we get out of here, okay. uh, the website. The website. You're going to be on. You're going to be on the road. We want to yes. plug the April, the April first, of course. Thank you. Uh, the, the show is is going to be on PBS stations all over the country. What's the website? Where can people follow you and find out what town you're going to be in? Everything is on this website called eveningwithgroucho.com. Eveningwithgroucho.com. The film is on there. All the broadcast dates for April are on there. My itinerary is on there for touring. Um, so that that's the best place to go, and I'm so excited that it's happening because it's all been self-generated. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not Jeffrey Rush, so I, I I've got to do the <laughs> I, you know I've got to do all the work. So I'm producing it. I'm doing the I'm booking the flights. I'm you know that's always been my career, and I'm kind of happy to be someone who's just been this journeyman in the middle kind of uh, performer and director. And uh, I've, it's you know the Groucho thing we talked a lot about has led to so many other great experiences in theater for me. Um, but eveningwithgroucho.com, uh, it's all it's all there, and you can find me on Facebook uh, under okay. Evening with Groucho, and on, on Instagram on Frank Ferrani's Groucho, and um, but well, you know, it, the, it is tr- truly a labor of love uh, uh, what you've done for for decades. You you know you, you you called it missionary work, and I think that's the best way to put it. And like us, you're a historian, you're an archivist, you're a preservationist. Uh, I say it a lot on this show. You are doing the Lord's work. Uh-huh. Uh, it's important, you know, and so I, I, I can't think of anybody uh, who is uh, who is uh, promoting uh, these the Marx Brothers. Well, Bader, uh-huh. yeah, you, Robert. And, you and Robert, and, and, and a handful of other yeah. people, Robert Robert Whitey, you mentioned. Sure, sure. Uh, but, it, it's uh, it's it's important to do because uh, Gilbert and I had lunch with a twenty something. What Gilbert a couple of years ago? Oh yes, she didn't know who Groucho was. She'd never heard of him. Right. And I don't know if that's uncommon, and it's okay. It just, yeah. We just got to keep going and, and uh, play to the one person who knows, as I was told by a director. Just play to the fans, and the, other, uh, the, the uninitiated will love it, uh, I hope. But, uh, yeah, we got to keep doing it, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of it. It's, uh, you should it is, be. It's a labor of love, and it's such a joy to be. I'm a fan of this show. I'm in the, when I'm on the road, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. I'm listening to your podcast. I'm laughing. I'm laughing with, and, and Gilbert, you give me laughter, and 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 
Frank, what you do to to to, to move it along and to and to add to and to enhance. It's a beautiful dynamic that you two have, and it's like a comedy team. And so it Thank feels you. it feels like a little slice of vaudeville. And we're getting everything we love. It, it's a fantasy fantasy show for someone like me. So thanks. We are the Gallagher and Sheen of podcasting. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, Teatro Zinzani the next time we have you back. That's right. That would be and your great. Your role as Caesar Francesco. Are you a Francesco like me, or are you? I just am. A... I was named after my, you know, not on the birth certificate. I was named after my grandpa Francesco Ferrante. Oh, so am I. Yeah. Oh, there you have Frances- it. See, Francesco Santo Padre. Yeah. Fran- and, uh, and I was born and raised in Palermo. <laughs> I don't know. Gil, I didn't know that about you. Uh, you're just, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I'm you were Sicilian. Still, I have trouble getting rid of the accent. I thought you were Calabrese, Gil. <laughs> All these oh years. God. Oh, my God. That's too, too good. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask one question, and yes. then you guys you guys can go out on a little music if you like. Mm-hmm. Sure. And this is, this is a desert island question. It's a little mm-hmm. bit cliched, but I like to ask it. I'm going to mm-hmm. ask Gil, too. So mm-hmm. I'll start with Gil. One scene, Gilbert, in one movie. Marx Brothers that you that you ha- that you could watch over and over again, or the only scene you could take to that uh, that desert oh. island that people talk oh about. Oh my God! Oh wow! Uh, I I I guess as much as it's not one of my favorite movies, I guess it would have to be. Uh, that scene in uh, Day at the Races where they're all examining. Margaret Dumont, because it's got all three of them there. Okay, that's a great one. I, I I'm going to pick the scene, the uh, the speakeasy scene in Horse Feathers. Great, great, which is yes. just which has everything mm-hmm. in it, and it just and, it, and talk about educational uh, <laughs> when you watch a Marx Brothers movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I finally, a friend of mine finally found out what calomel <laughs> was. Oh, like, yeah. sometimes they take aspirin, sometimes they take a calomel. I'd walk a mile for a calomel. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Amy. What is it, Gil? Is it like an antacid? It, yeah, it was some kind of a powder for mm-hmm. headaches. Mm-hmm. I loved, I was going to say the, the examination scene, too, uh, when he's dancing. I love that scene. That's my favorite, even though the movie is not the best of them, but it's he's great in that. And I could watch on a loop him singing on that canoe, Everyone says I love you. Oh, it's oh great. yeah. Everyone says I love you. What's better? And then the, the lifesaver bit and Thelma Todd, and just oh. he's just so brutal and funny. And to see him on in his glory playing the guitar, I, I, it makes me happy. So I can. And, I, and I, that's another thing. <laughs> um, like I heard Mel Brooks when he auditions actors, likes to hear them sing, mm-hmm. because there's like a combination, like uh, that. Great comedians were also great musicians. Like mm-hmm. the Marx Brothers were great musicians. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, well, he, all of them. And uh, you know, Groucho even was self-taught on the piano. I mean, he he, he was remarkable. I I used to love you know, and Bill Marx. Talk about Bill Marx. Bill Marx. Yeah, we had to, Bill here. Say hi for us if you I, see. I, him. I, I will. And I uh, he used to you know accompany Groucho at the very end of his life. And I was at a party at Bader's a couple, Robert, a couple of years ago, Thanksgiving. And there's Bill Marks, and we started. He started playing "Hooray for Captain Spaulding," and I'm singing along with Harpo's son, this jazz musician. Great. It was the most surreal, moving moment. I'm singing "Show Me a Rose," and I kept thinking he used to play for old Groucho. I mean, this is a privilege. I'm feeling. I'm, I feel so honored to uh, to be able to do that. And and we we hadn't rehearsed. And he's such a great listener. And we had this. We entertained the party, and it was kind of private. Yet there were people, you know, hanging around. But it was. Hey, it was pretty thrilling to be singing Liddy the Tattooed Lady. You know, with, of course. With Bill, with Bill with Marks. Harpo's kid. <laughs> and, and see, now there's another case of a movie that was a terrible movie, but mm-hmm. Liddy the Tattooed Lady is a great moment. So brilliant. Yeah. Br- yeah. Brilliant. You could find something in all of them. Even mm-hmm. even in the, in, in the big store, you know, you can find little moments. Mm-hmm. In in uh, in even the ones that don't work, and maybe I not. Remember, maybe not love happy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I remember we had uh, when we had uh, Bill Marks on, who of course was Harpo's son, and I always fuck up the intro <laughs> when I'm doing it, and and Bill Marks said. Uh, you learned how to talk from my father. <laughs> yeah, that's really great. That's a great ad lib. 
<laughs> oh, that's beautiful. No, that's like I say, part of the joy of doing this uh, this show for so long is you get to meet these people like Bill and and you name it and down the down the whole line. I love it. Bill's a great guy. Yeah, and, you got to be you got to be friends with with uh, with more than a few Marx yeah, Brothers yeah. offspring. I did. I did. Yeah, we and, didn't even mention I realized, Maxine. I actually met Burl a bunch of times. Oh, yeah? There you go. It's coming yeah. back to you, Gil. Save it for the yeah. next show. <laughs> <laughs> you guys want to... Again, Frank, it, it's a, it was an honor to have you here, and oh. we're so thrilled that you're doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. It's mutual. Thanks for uh, putting a little spotlight on it today, gentlemen. Appreciate oh. it. Oh. Can, uh, can we try? What? Did we get that? Um, I must be going, or should we try that again? Yeah, you, or you could do a little Father's Day or whatever oh, you guys okay. whatever you guys are feeling. But do, do want, yeah. but, but do separate sections because yes, over Zoom yes. you have to separate it. We'll trade off, trade off. Okay. You want me to go first or you go yes, first? Yeah. You want old You'll gra- be the young Groucho. Okay, okay, Why don't okay. you start? I'll, young, I'll do young Groucho. Today, Father is Father's Day. And we're giving you a sigh. It's not much, I know. It is just a way of showing you. We think you're a regular guy. You say that it was nice of us to bother. But it really was a pleasure to fuss. For according to our mother, you're a father. Together. And that's good enough for us. Yes, that's that's good enough for for us. (laughs) Is there anything further, Father? That can't be right. Is there anything further, Father? The idea. <laughs> I love me some horse feathers. <laughs> me too. Frank, there's so many things we didn't get to, but I think we covered the uh, we pretty much covered now, the Now did we get the ending of that song? Or is yeah, that Yeah, you up? got it. You got a, you got enough of it. Well, to quote the man, we must be going. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Gilbert will so keep fun. Gilbert will keep asking questions. I, uh, I don't yes. mind. You call me any time. I'm around. All right. So, call so. call them at 3 a.m., Gilbert. I'm <laughs> I'll be, Ask I'll be, him who was playing the manicurist in, a, in the state room scene. Uh, call me at 3 a.m. I'll be listening to your podcast somewhere in Paducah, so do that. Okay? Uh, so. You're the best. The, the fact that you, you'd be in one of these theaters doing Groucho and listening to our show at 3 o'clock in the uh, morning warms my heart. Uh, thank you. Thanks for keeping it up, guys. Thank you're you. The, you're the best, Ferrante. All right, All right, th- Gilbert, great to meet you. Frank, thank oh, you Oh, great so meeting much. you. And hope Frank, to see you guys again. A thrill, yeah. and we will do it again. Oh, well, first, hold on. Um, well, this has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with our co-host Frank Sancho Padre. And on the show, we had Frank Ferrante, who does an imitation of Groucho. So he's not Groucho, but he does an imitation. <laughs> he's an incredible simulation. <laughs> back in my day... If you sounded like somebody and it wasn't you, then you were doing an imitation. <laughs> and, and he goes up on stage and he puts on a must Now, a mustache in my case was... <laughs> I hope you're recording this because I want this. Oh, uh, we'll send it to you. <laughs> it was hair that was underneath your nose. Now, some people could paint on a mustache, and that paint back in my day was... <laughs> He'll keep going. Somebody get the hook. No, don't stop. <laughs> I wish was I could... Something... <laughs> Do not stop. Was something that you could buy in a can if you were going to paint your kitchen. And the kitchen in my day was a room where you'd, you'd, you'd make food. And that was called the kitchen. And food in my day. <laughs> Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. You're the best. You're the best. I love stick you around. guys. Stick, we'll say goodbye. Stick around and do an ID for us. All right. Thank, thank you, Gilbert. Priceless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank so, you. Frank, thank you. You bet.